as a church, we are strong in promoting commandment keeping. So many of our doctrines are linked to obedience, to God's word. And that is vitally important. Both testaments of our Bible clearly teach it. As important as this is, however, we may be missing an attribute of God that is essential. Some may think of him as demanding, ordering, denouncing for sin, strict, legalistic, etc. Some may think God's approach is, take it or leave it, it doesn't make any difference to me, it's up to you. It's true that when God speaks, we're not to treat his word lightly. But have we missed something about his desire for us that would change our understanding of his nature in regards to obeying him? In this split sermon, we're going to study a set of scriptures from the Old Testament that should redefine the image of the God of the Hebrew Bible. He is not the harsh, wrathful God imaged, imagined by many, including many professing Christians. The title of this sermon is, If Only, dot, dot, dot. If Only, dot, dot, dot. Now let's begin in the Psalms to understand and get the right perspective and the right principle. Psalm 107, and we'll go to verse 43. Psalm, excuse me, 107 and verse 43. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. In the poetic books of the Bible, wisdom refers to knowing and observing God's commands with reverence. Knowing and observing God's commands. That is wisdom in the poetic books. And he says, such a person will come to understand God's mercy, God's everlasting and steadfast love. That's the key to wisdom. A steady focus on his steadfast love because God is just, he is merciful, and so loyal to, loyalty to him and his law is truly wise. They shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. That word loving kindness is the same Hebrew word as mercy in verse 1. Now, with that principle in mind, let's seek for the wisdom of God. As we go back to the Pentateuch, Moses' last book, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Moses wrote this book not long before his death. And in it, he recounts God's law for the people who are about to enter the promised land under the general Joshua. They had rebelled against God multiple times, and as a result of their sin, God said they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So Moses recounts the word of God for them, going into a new situation. The promised land would be very different than the desert from which they have come. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 28. Deuteronomy 5, 28. The Lord heard the voice of your words. They asked Moses to talk to God, as opposed to him talking to him directly. The Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They have well said all that they have spoken. Now notice. Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Oh, that. I think we can modernize that with if 
only. If only there was such a heart in them, a renewed heart, a willing heart, that they would fear God, keep his commandments always. It would be well with them and then all the succeeding generations, all their children thereafter. This is known as divine pleadings. God is appealing to his people. He's reasoning to persuade them to do the right thing, do the honorable thing, to be obedient, and he would bless them. It's like a courtroom scene in which God makes his case against his own people. Why do you disobey? And they had done that for 40 years. And he says, oh, if only. This is a heart-rending plea of God that has never been totally fulfilled, but will be on in through the millennium and the new heavens and new earth. This is part of what in the Hebrew is called a figure of speech. Aeonismus is what it's called in which God expresses his feeling of wishing and appeal, hoping for a thing to happen. By this figure, what is said is changed from a plain statement to the expressing of it as a hope, an ardent desire, a lively anticipation often introduced with words, oh, that. And there are a number of examples in which verses begin this way. Oh, that, if only, which we as Bible students should call to mind, and we can search out for ourselves very easily with all the biblical tools we have today. Now, what do we mean by a figure of speech? A figure is simply a word or a sentence thrown into a peculiar form, different from the original or simple meaning or use. It's a deliberate manipulation of ordinary language in order to create a literary effect. And these forms are used constantly in general talk all the time. You and I use them all the time. For example, it's raining cats and dogs. Not literally, but we say that in that expression. Or, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Uh, let's, that, let's make that a cow. That's called a figure of speech. It relates to the form in which the words are used. It consists in the fact that a word or words are used out of their ordinary sense or place or manner for the purpose of attracting our attention to what's said in order to emphasize what is said. So here we have God's own explanation, so to speak, of his own words. If only. And in the Hebrew, the language is very emphatic. Who will give that there may be such a heart in them? They refuse to receive such a heart from me. Who else could supply it? He's reasoning with them. Such a heart. To have such a heart like this is the secret of eternal blessing. The failing is that God liked what he saw in Israel, but he hoped through this figure of speech because God doesn't hope for things the way we do that they would keep the same attitude of heart. Israel did not keep this heart, and not 40 days later, they danced around and worshipped around a golden calf after God gave the commandments the first time. Disobedience to God's laws resulted in death and expulsion from the land, which is what God warned back in Deuteronomy 4. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto you go over Jordan to possess it. You shall not prolong your days on it, but shall utterly be destroyed. But he says, if you keep my commandments, it will be well with you and your children forever. That's God's motive for calling for our obedience, that it might be well with us. Every command of God is rooted in his love for us, not some obsessive desire for controlling us or some mean-spirited attitude towards us. Look at verse 32. You shall observe to do, therefore, verse 32, as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live 
and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land in which you shall possess. They would have permanency, steadfastness in the promised land, not only for them, but for all succeeding generations. Now, at the end of the book, Deuteronomy 32, as we turn there now, this is part of what's called the Song of Moses. And in it, he contrasts God's perfections and his special goodness to Israel's ingratitude and apostasy. And Moses, now after 40 years being their leader, is exhorting them to set their hearts on these words for their own good. About 1407 B.C., Moses will not go into the promised land because of his own sin. It's a heartbreaking story after all he put up with. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 28. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that, if only they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. If only they would look way into the future. Oh, that. And it's interesting, Adam Clark in his commentary says he's thinking very long range. The latter times, the glorious days of the coming Messiah. Should they carefully consider the subject and obey the coming Messiah, they would consequently be the kind of people who would meet their obligations to God. If only they would have that kind of a vision. Oh, that they were wise and understood this and consider their latter end, where they're going. What's ahead for them? Let's go and look at another one now in Psalm 81. Psalm 81, and these hymns of praise come from various people and come from several ages of biblical history. Psalm 81, to the chief musician upon Gatith. Psalm 81, verse 13. Here it begins with those same words. Oh, that my people had hearkened to me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued, subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. If only. And again, Clark says nothing could be more plaintive than the original the Hebrew here. The sense and sound are surprisingly united. One has never found in any poet, Greek or Latin, a finer example of deep-seated grief, unable to express itself in appropriate words without frequent interruptions of sighs and sobs terminated with a mournful cry. You see, God expresses himself this way. He has that much emotion towards his people. Oh, if only our God truly cares about us and wants the best for us. And you remember, in the New Testament, Jesus wept over Jerusalem because of what he knew was coming with the invasion of the Romans. About 40 years later, the total destruction of a city again. God and his son have deep emotion for their people. If only we would obey. And so in the rest of that chapter, God lists six things he would have done for Israel if they had only obeyed. You can read that for yourself. But Israel had to meet the conditions of the promises of God to receive their benefits. And so it is with all of us today. No person, even believers, will receive benefits without meeting God's conditions. Let's go to Proverbs. Chapter 1, Proverbs, book of Proverbs, we'll start in chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20, wisdom cries without, she utters her voice in the streets. Now here, wisdom is personified, another figure of speech, it's called personification, assigning human attributes to non-human things. He does this again in chapter 8 as well. 
Proverbs 1, verse 20. Wisdom cries outside. She utters her voice in the streets. Verse 24. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not, all my counsel. You would have none of my reproof. And wisdom says, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. He will hold them in derision, as Psalm 2 talks about. We sing that in one of our hymns. Verse 27, when your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. It's too late at that point. They shall seek me early, but they will not find me. Isn't that heartbreaking? He says in verse 30, they would have none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkens unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Refusal of wisdom's call. God lists 12 reasons here why they had to be condemned. But he had stretched out his hand. He was appealing to them to come to him, to be obedient, and they would not listen. We're going to work our way progressively through the Old Testament. So let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. About 740 B.C., God, through his prophet, charges Judah and Jerusalem with base ingratitude, atrocious wickedness. He describes their deplorable condition. He abhors their sacrifices. He calls them to repentance with promises of forgiveness. And he warns them against their obstinate rebellion. He had every right to wipe them out. But look what he says, Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, though they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. He's offering them an opportunity to be forgiven. He sets before them the alternatives of renewed blessing or final judgment. But the choice was theirs because he has given us free moral agency. The people's sins will be removed and replaced by ethical purity. Obvious by the color crimson and red to be washed away and made white like wool. He says, let us reason together. You see, faith in the God of creation and redemption is not credulity, but fully consistent with all true spiritual reason, a reasonable faith. Let us reason together. Let's put the matter right. Let's settle this. Let's put an end to all this dispute. Let's settle our differences. Such reasoning where both parties state their own case and we'll put an end to all reasoning. It's again, a courtroom scene. The sinner will see his need, give himself to God. Then God will be just in cleansing him from all of his sin. Let us reason together. It's interesting that he talks about your sins being as scarlet. As scarlet, he gives a repeated simile, set of similes here, as scarlet, as white as snow, like crimson, as full, another figure of speech. There's many, many of these in the Hebrew Bible, and as well as in Greek. But scarlet refers to a deep dye obtained from a small worm found on oak leaves in Mediterranean countries. Related to the Hebrew word shana, which means double, in other words, one's sins have been double dipped in a deep scarlet dye of this cocos worm, permanently stained wool. But if they would just confess their sins, they would have those 
garments washed and made pure and white as snow. God says this is possible because God is a forgiving God. If only they would heed God and turn to him. Let's go to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, about 725 B.C. now. Isaiah 28, verse 21. The Jews are severely rebuked for their drunkenness, unteachableness, carnal security. Verse 21, for the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring it to pass, his strange act. Rise up in judgment as in the valley of Gibeon. That refers to David's victory over the Philistines the valley of Gibeon. But God says judgment is his strange work. The judgment on Judah is called a strange work because of being God's complete destruction of his own people instead of the enemies as it had been once before. And then he calls it his strange act. Strange work. Turning against his own people. Unwanted. It's not what he wanted. For his people. A strange act. Let's go to Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48. 48, 18. Oh that. If only. You would hearken to my commandments. Then had your peace been as a river. And your righteousness. As the waves of the sea. Verse 19, your seed also had been as sand. In the offspring of your bowels, your body, like the gravel thereof, his name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Oh, that, reminding us of two verses we've just read. Oh, that, Deuteronomy 5.29 and Psalm 81.13. Here again, God's earnest desire is to bless men, not curse them. <coughs> He doesn't want men to sin. He wants them to keep his laws. He wants them to be saved instead of being punished eternally. He says, if you do, you will have peace, well-being, prosperity. Your peace, this peace, is wholeness, soundness, health, prosperity, holiness, every good of every kind like a river flowing abundantly, even overflowing its banks. Your righteousness as the waves of the sea, boundless and powerful as the waves of the sea, constantly rolling to bless men. We have many pictures like this in our Bible. You have to understand them as these picturesque language of that time. Let's go to Isaiah 55. Start in verse 1, Isaiah 55. This is about 683 B.C. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come you to the waters, he that has no money. Come, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently to me and eat that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David. Here is this invitation again. God appealing to them. The waters, wine, milk, bread and other benefits. Are to be understood spiritually here. For they are the only things that can be bought without money. The invitation is from God who is not in the business of selling material things. But he does have the blessings pictured here figuratively that he offers us. In the ancient East, it was very common for people who were selling one of these items, water, wine, milk, bread, to say, Ho, everyone that thirsts or is hungry, come. Come and see me now. Take freely. Water, a metaphor, as one of the Jewish 
scholars years ago said, a metaphor for law and wisdom. The world cannot subsist without this kind of water. It's impossible. The law is also compared to wine and milk. To wine because, as we read in Scripture, wine rejoices the heart. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. It's also compared to milk because milk is the subsistence of a child. Remember Jesus said, Whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be of the well of water springing up to everlasting life, given only to those who thirst and who ask for it. The waters of life. The last chapter of our Bible, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let every... Let him that hears say, come, let him hear, sorry, let him that is a thirst, come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And then Psalms talks about the wine of gladness, wine that makes glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, bread that strengthens his heart, milk of nourishment as newborn babes. 1 Peter 2, 2, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And it's offered freely. Let's go to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. The Almighty declares his free mercy and his conversion of the Gentiles. And his justice in casting off Israel for a time because of their wickedness. About 683 B.C., God inspires Isaiah to write, verse 1, I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought not me not. I said, behold me, behold me to a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people that walks in a way that's not good after their own thoughts. But he says, I was found by those that I didn't call. And here he's talking about the Gentiles who responded favorably to God. You know that very verse is taken by Paul in Romans 10 when he's talking about the fullness of the Gentiles when the Israelites were temporarily set aside to open the door to allow Gentiles to come into the faith. And the book of Acts gives you example after example of how that when the Jews rejected the truth, the Gentiles freely received it. And it's based on this passage that comes from Isaiah. And God says, I am sought of those who did not ask for me. He seeks to assure the Jews that they are not forgotten, that they will be fully restored to favor and eternal blessing under the Messiah. He was found of them that did not ask for him. That refers to the Gentiles being converted and still are to this very day. He says, behold me, come to me. And again, this relates to what God had inspired Moses to write way back in Deuteronomy. He said in Deuteronomy 32, they moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those that are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. The Israelites have been stubborn and hard-hearted throughout their history. Let's go to Jeremiah 2. God reminds Judah and Israel of his former kindnesses. He protests to them about their ungrateful, unreasonable apostasies, and idolatries. Jeremiah 2, verse 5, about 627 B.C. Thus says the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me that they have gone far from me and walked after their vanity and are become vain? God says, What did I do wrong that you have turned aside from me? Did I commit some sin against you? And yet the Pentateuch tells us this again in Deuteronomy. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. 
He's a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. God reasons with them. With them. I've committed no sin against you. And you've turned to your vanities. That's a word for their idols. Idolaters always become like the gods they worship. They're vain. And this chapter goes on to list ten sins of Judah. In fact, a number of these chapters that we have turned to goes on to list ten, twelve, twenty sins in a row of how they had turned against their Almighty. Verse 9, verse 9, Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, says the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. See again, courtroom case. I'm going to make a case. I'm going to explain what was offered you and ask you to explain yourself. Jeremiah 7, verse 13. Jeremiah 7, 13. Jeremiah 7, 13. Now because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you didn't answer. Therefore will I do to this house which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and to the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, I will cast you out of my sight, as I cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. God says, I rose up early in the morning and sent to you, that is, referring to his prophets. Thirty-five times we have this expression, rising up early in the Bible, Eleven of them are in Jeremiah alone. It's a Hebrew idiom. It was He was very eager to get this word to them, rising up in the early in the morning, eagerly trying to get them to reconsider, turn around, come back to him. I spoke to you through the prophets right from the very beginning. Look at verse 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth of the land of Egypt to this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily, rising up early and sending them. All these hundreds of years, God has been appealing to them, sending man after man after man that they turned their backs on, despised, imprisoned, martyred. And God was trying to reach his people. But Israel was hard-hearted. Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah 44. Starting in verse 4. Howbeit I sent to you all my servants the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. You see, God, even at this point, has not washed his hands of them. But they hearken not nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn no incense to other gods. Wherefore, my fury and my anger was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they waste, are wasted not and desolate. They are wasted, rather, and desolate as it is this day. He's appealing to them again, do not do this abominable things thing. God is said to grieve, to mourn, to be moved with compassion. He's represented as tenderly protesting, do not do this thing. I entreat you, don't do it. Ezekiel chapter 18. And he would say this to his prophets, and they would turn them aside. Turn a deaf ear to these men who are dedicated to giving God's word faithfully. Ezekiel 18, about 592 B.C. now. God speaks to another prophet. Ezekiel 18, 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God? 
and not that he should return from his ways and live. Do I have any pleasure in seeing people perish? My children is so foreign to him, to this God of love, whose nature is mercy. On the contrary, he wills that people return, repent, come back to him. God can have no pleasure in seeing the wicked, even the wicked die. Verse 31, cast away from all your trans, uh, cast away from all from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will you die o house of israel why now in the millennium and beyond there is going to be offered to god's people who are willing a new heart and a new spirit and that is yet to come. Thank God. And that's what it takes. A new heart and a new spirit. For God's people to turn around and obey him willingly. Verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies. Says the Lord God. Wherefore turn yourselves and live. Turn and live. Chapter 33. 33, in verse 31, 33, 31, God says to his prophet, they come before you as people come. They sit before you as my people. They hear your words, but they won't do them. For with their mouth they show much love, <clears throat> excuse me, but their heart goes after their covetousness. For lo, you are unto them as a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. Oh, they enjoyed the entertainment. Reminds us of so-called Christian observances even today. A lot of music, a lot of praising of God. They'll sit before the preacher and all the musicians and then go away and live like the devil the rest of the week. Even after hearing the words of the Bible. That was going on in Ezekiel's time as well. It was a sham. Let's go to Hosea chapter 11. Again, we're continuing to work our way through progressively. Right through the Old Testament. Now about 725 B.C., Hosea was inspired to write this for God. Hosea 11 verse 8. How shall I give you up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver you, Israel? How shall I make you as Adma and Zeboim? My heart is turned within me. My repentings, that is my compassions, my sympathy are kindled together. He says, how could I turn you over as Adma and Zeboim? Two cities that were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah, according to Genesis. Here God's compassion goes out to Ephraim. He did not want to destroy him. His heart is so moved within him with compassions that he's torn torn between these two decisions. Justice demanded judgment. And yet his mercy demanded that he overlook and pardon these sins. Ephraim was so sinful there was nothing left to do but destroy And God has been pleading with his people. He does not want to bring judgment. He's under obligation to act according to his law. And yet he reluctantly does so. My heart is turned within me. Justice demands your punishment, but mercy pleads for your life. And he's reasoning with himself. God did not want to have to do it. 
Doesn't that explain and give us a different dimension of our God? Let's go to Micah chapter 6. After Jonah. Micah 6. Micah 6 and verse 3. Oh, my people. What have I done to you? Wherein have I wearied you? Tell me, testify against me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, redeemed you from the house of servants. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Verse 7, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? Here it is. Do justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. He wanted people to respond in kind to his nature. It's as if God is condescending to come down and talk with them. To humble himself before them saying, I've explained this to you over these hundreds of years. What have I done to you that you have acted this way? Nothing. Nothing would have caused you to act this way. And I've appealed to you. I've explained to you. In order for us to have a good working family relationship, you must do justly. Love mercy and walk humbly. With your God. Well, let's turn to one more verse. We don't go to this book very often. The little book of Lamentations is right after the book of Jeremiah, written by Jeremiah, in which he writes a lamentation in which Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, is shedding tears, crying out loud because of what he has just witnessed the total destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. And yet, through this prophet, at this horrible time, God inspires him to write this. Lamentations 3, verse 32. Lamentations 3, 32. But though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. He does not do it willingly. Even though he causes grief for a time, he will have compassion. He reluctantly punishes. It's like a parent reluctantly having to punish, punish a child, and yet it's for their own good. And from here, brethren, this leads us right into our New Testament, offer of salvation to the Messiah's sacrifice. The God of the Hebrew Bible knows we are but flesh and cannot please him with our sinful natures. He provided a sacrifice, God did, that removes our unconverted heart of stone and gives us a new spirit when we repent and turn to a living God from idols. The God that we've been reading about, brethren, today from the Old Testament is the one we know as our Savior, Christ the Lord, who appeals to his hearers to repent and turn to him because judgment is a strange work to him. It is foreign to his nature. However, his plan of salvation rescues us from our deplorable state and offers us eternal life with him in his eternal kingdom. That's the theme of our next testament, the next testament of our Bibles.